Mr. Jeff up. All right, so we are going to do Children's Church, but not yet. Before we do Children's Church, we need the grade ones to come up. So we've got Daniel, 10, Daniel 10, um, Zoe, and Christopher. Come on, not you, we've got three of you. Come out and see you. I brought one of my Bibles, I always bring one of my Bibles. Have you guys learned how to read yet? No? Yes? Can you read, Zoe? All right, we're going to test you out here. Hey, come on up here. Okay, so uh, let's find something in my Bible here. Okay, so can you read that? Yeah. Okay. Because it's not English, that's why. You guys have ever seen these letters before? Look at these ones. Does that look strange? Have you seen that before? No. You know why that is? It's French. It looks like French. It's actually Hebrew. You know what the Old Testament was written in Hebrew? And the New Testament was written in Greek. Not English. You guys know any other languages? Do you know any other words in any other languages? You know a French word? What word do you know? Bonjour, very good. Any other words? There's lots of languages, right? How many other languages are there? There's French, English, German, Japanese. Yeah, that's a good one. Do you know how many Bibles, how many languages in the world have a Bible that they can read? Take a guess, how many languages do you think there is? Ten, that's a good guess, it's more. Can you guess a higher number than ten? A hundred? Thirteen? Three thousand. You know there's three thousand different languages that have some of the Bible in it? And you know how many languages there are that have no Bibles? More than a thousand. So there's lots of people in this world, if they want to go read their Bible, they actually can. Because they haven't translated from these funny letters into, into their language yet. So today we're thankful that we speak English because you have a Bible in your language that you get to read. So we're going to give each of you a Bible here from the church. Daniel. Ten. Zoe. And Christopher. All right. So don't go anywhere yet. But these Bibles are a gift, so as you guys learn how to read, you can take these to church or to Sunday school, and you can read. And then, if you don't know how to read yet, you ask your mom and dad, and I bet you they know how to read. And they can probably read you some things from there. Sound good? Okay, we're going to get all the other kids up for children's church, and then we're going to dismiss you guys to children, children's church. So anyone to ages 2 to 6, is it still 6, Julia? Yeah. 2 to 6, come on up, and then... We're going to dismiss you to the children's church. You guys have to take your Bibles with you. That's okay. You can go very soon now. Oh, yeah. Just grade ones get Bibles. So all of you young ones, when you get to grade one, then you get to be up here and you get a Bible too. All right. We're going to pray, and you guys are going to go to the children's church. Oh, a couple more coming up. Yep. Okay, let's pray. It's your second Bible. That's fantastic. You're going to be coming. Father, thank you for these gifts. Thank you for your word. Thank you that it's translated into our language. Um, pray a blessing on these kids as they learn to read, and they would read your word and know you. And for the rest of these kids, we pray your blessing on them as they go to children's church. Amen. Amen. Now you can go. Your second Bible too. All right, let's start a collection. <coughs> I'm going to invite uh, Lauren, where's Lauren from The Rock, uh, to share a little bit about what's going on at The Rock uh, this fall. And then we'll
Good morning. That's so cool that you actually respond. I've totally done that at different church, and it's just like dead silence. I'm like, <laughs> so it is so wonderful to get to be here today and share with you a little bit about God's work at YFC, my role at YFC, and what God has been teaching me lately. I think it's been about nine months since I've shared with you, and so a lot has happened in nine months. <laughs> so yeah, my name. I'm like Lauren West Tabor, but I'm also Lauren Johnston because I got married in May, and so it's like weird to be like, I'm Lauren Johnston. Sometimes people will say that, and I'm like, who is that? <laughs> but I am the female program coordinator at The Rock, and I am so blessed to get to fill that role. So this past year, I was able to start holding regular monthly girls' events, which were an absolute blast. <laughs> they help foster such amazing moments and opportunities for connections, and through these events, we've actually been able to start a girls' Bible study just really dive into discipleship with many girls at The Rock. I have been able to continue walking closely with a few girls in particular by way of mentorship relationships, which has been really wonderful. It's a beautiful process of just caring for teens, reminding them of their worth and dignity in Jesus, and being a safe adult to just work through some of the circumstances they are currently in. So all in all, working at The Rock is the coolest thing ever. But with this update, I also wanted to be honest, and I wanted to share about some of the challenges of this role. Um, yeah, and this role and this position that I'm really blessed to be in. So, this past year, there's been so many awesome moments, but there's also been moments where I've been so overwhelmed that I feel like I cannot even breathe because I'm so heartbroken over some of the circumstances that so many teens have to live in and through. There are days I feel defeated, and I feel helpless, I feel powerless, and there are moments where I genuinely question God and why he put me in situations that, like, I have no sway in, right? Like, I'm, I'm not a part of every aspect of their life. So one day this past winter in particular, I had an experience with a teen that just really shook my world. This teen was in a difficult situation at home, and I knew they were really sad, overwhelmed, and exhausted. And I thought to myself, I bet this teen, this teen needs some chicken fingers, because we have bonded over our mutual love of chicken fingers. So I arranged to go for supper with this team. Later that day, I headed out for supper, and I took, you know when you can tell somebody's really not okay? Like you can just look in their eyes, and you just like, they seem like a shell of themselves. And I, look one, I took one look at her, and I was like, oh dear. Now for the sake of confidentiality, I can't share everything that was going on, but I can tell you that this team was in a lot of pain, and they felt really isolated and broken. A lot of responsibility and pressure had been put on this team, and as I sat and I listened to her, I listened to their stories, their circumstances, I fought back tears the whole time. Even just being beside them and listening to their heartbreak was overwhelmingly sad, and it wasn't even happening to me. So after this, I headed back to the drop-in center, and I am dead, like emotionally tapped out. I am overwhelmed, I'm sad, I'm fighting back tears, and I'm like, oh dear goodness, I have a three-hour drop-in to run. <laughs> So that's what it does, I cried in the bathroom a little bit. But anyways, after that, I prayed, and I told God, I don't see you here, I don't know what to do, and I don't know where you are. And I begged him for help. So the night continues on, I'm super caffeinated, I'm exhausted, it's a crazy night. And then I have this moment of connection with this teen again. And as I'm thinking about how helpless I feel, this teen pipes up out of nowhere and just asks me if there's any Bibles left that they could have. They saw me handing them out at girls' events the night before. And I just never like, I stood there in like, disbelief. I kind of like, I didn't have words right away. And here I was feeling really hopeless, and I couldn't see God working, I couldn't see God moving, and I was thinking so negatively. But in actuality, God was moving, is moving, inspiring their hearts to ask for a Bible, meeting them where they were at. And it was just this moment of like, duh, of course God is moving. As a staff at YFC, we've been learning a lot about this idea of God, of joining in God's work, not just asking God to like, Joey, come, like, you know, like the classic prayer, like, join our ministry. Um, and I've wrestled with these concepts. It's been a hard, a hard learning curve to be like, this isn't my ministry, this is what God's doing. It is so evident when I work with teenagers that I am not God, um, but that God is working even when I can't see it. I cannot change circumstances. I cannot heal. I cannot save. But God can. He can change things. Hearts, minds, circumstances. He can heal. He can save. He can work in the darkest of circumstances. He loves these teens more than I ever could. They are his teens, not mine. 
He cares about the teenage girl who is in so much pain that cutting themselves seems like the only option. He cares about the teenage girl whose parents told her she'd amount to nothing. He cares about the crippling anxiety so many teenagers feel in their homes and in their schools. He cares about the traumatized teen who lives each day in fear of what might be done to her. He cares for the teens who feel like they're worthless. He cares. And in that moment, I saw that my role at YFC isn't to exercise a savior complex and live this overburdened life because I'm trying to be Jesus. Instead, it's to follow Jesus and let him use me. My role is to seek after God with all of my heart, my mind, my soul, my body, to say yes to where he is already working and be willing to follow his lead. Now, that doesn't mean that's not like a cop out of like, oh, God's working, I don't need to do anything. There's a lot of work to do. God needs his people, all of us, to say yes to where he wants us to go. To slow down, that's a tough one for me. To slow down and help that person that you see is struggling. To make room in your life for serving and living out the gospel message in all that you do. But he wants us to join him in his work, to say yes to his call on your life and to just show his character by being the hands and feet of Jesus at work where he is already working. Besides moments like these, our drop-in is getting started soon. We are getting ready to spray paint the fence once more. Tim and I are both really pumped. As well, both girls and guys nights are going to be happening this year. And in order to do this, we need a lot of volunteers. We need prayer, really need prayer warriors. We need financial partners. So if you are able to partner with us in any of these ways, we would really appreciate it. And Tim and I would love if you reached out. As well, this is my little plug, if you don't have any lunch plans today, you should come to The Rock. We're having our barbecue. We're really pumped, and it helps with all general programming costs. And you are all invited. So thank you so much for listening to what God has been teaching me. And I truly pray that each of you will choose to join God where he is already at work and be inspired by the power of the gospel to say yes to the moments and opportunities God has for us to join him in the work he's doing already in the world and in the hearts of his people. Thank you. Amen. We're dismissed. <laughs> Thanks, Lauren, for the work that you do. Yeah. Lots of heartache out there, but there's lots of people who are faithfully walking alongside these people and the so Thank you, Lauren, for what you do and all the volunteers at YFC here and there. I and see you guys here. Yeah, there's lots, uh, lots of good work being done, and God is at work, even when we don't see it. And you have no idea how much you're tying into my sermon, and halfway through you'll be like, oh, I just said that. So um, it's all going to make perfect sense. So let's jump in. We've got to get to the barbecue after lunch here. Uh, no introduction. We're just going to talk about Exodus uh, from now until Christmas. Um, last last year, at uh, this time, we started the book of Genesis, and we walked through Genesis from September till December. This year, we're going to pick up Exodus, and next year we'll come back and we'll dive into Leviticus and Numbers, um, and we'll just keep working our way through these first five books of the Bible. So I hear some of you page flipping there. I want you to holler out the very first word of the book of Exodus. Well. What? These? Now? No one has any other option? Alright, so we already introduced the Hebrew. You're going to get a lot. If you like the little Hebrew tidbits, you're going to get your share of those. The first word of the book of Exodus in Hebrew is and. None of your Bibles do that, I don't think. But that's actually how the book of Exodus starts. And these are the names of the people who came into the land. So what does that tell us? That tells us we're in the middle of a story. And means something came before that. And what came before that is Genesis. And so we're in the middle of a story um, that continues all the way through. Scripture is one uh, continuous story. How does the Bible project, how do they say that? One continuous story that points to Jesus. Begins in Genesis, points all the way to the future that hasn't come yet. So it's a couple thousand year old story. And we get an opportunity to enter into this story, and something else happens. 
So last fall we went through Genesis, and Genesis, just a little recap of what we hear for the, for the fall, God creates the world as a temple, a place for him to live with his people, and he lives in perfect unity with his people for two whole chapters. Sin enters the world, and people start hiding from God. It's not that God hid from people. We sometimes get that backwards. It's actually the people who hid from God. And in different ways, we've been hiding from God ever since. And the whole story of Scripture is God getting back to being with His people. And Exodus is a big part of that theme. He goes to great lengths to be with His people. And so towards the end of Genesis, as they're just about to go from the land of Canaan down to, uh, down to Egypt, here's what God says to Jacob. Before he goes down. So Exodus takes place in the land of Egypt. So this is what God says. I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. I will go down to Egypt with you, and I'll surely bring you back again. This is God's promise as his people go to Egypt as he says, I'm going to go with you guys. When you go to that foreign place, when you go to that difficult place, I'm actually going with you. And that's our first little bit that we grab out of Exodus, is that God's with us in hard places. God says, do not be afraid to go to school. When you go to school, I will go with you. Do not be afraid to go to work. When you go to work, I will be with you. Do not be afraid to go into that doctor's office, not knowing what the results are going to be, because I'll go with you. And this is, we're learning God's character, is that when you go into a hard place, God says, don't be afraid, I'm going to go with you. It doesn't mean everything will be hunky-dory, but God will be present. So they go to Egypt. So the people of Israel, just 70 of them, they, they go to Egypt, and they were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was full of them. Another little hyperlink back to Genesis. There's a couple words in there that you recognize from Genesis chapter 1. What are the two words that you recognize from Genesis chapter 1 in there? God commanded the people to be fruitful and to multiply. This is a, a link back to Genesis. They're doing what they're supposed to do. They're being fruitful and they're multiplying. And they are doing a really good job of it. And there are lots and lots of little Israelites running around because they're following God's command to be fruitful and multiply. And they're there for 400 years. That's a long time. We don't really know what 400 years is. Um, 400 years ago, this country was not even settled by Europeans yet. That's a, that's a long time ago. Um, so 400 years go by, a new pharaoh comes along, and he says, too many Israelites around. Too many of them. Come, we must deal wisely uh, with them, or they will become even more numerous and if war breaks out, they'll join our enemies and they'll fight against us and leave the, and leave the country. So the word your Bible might say shrewdly, um, it's actually the word wisely. So Pharaoh says, okay, we got to be wise about these guys. But it turns out that Pharaoh is a fool. He's resting on his own wisdom and everything he does doesn't work out because he's actually not wise at all. He's the anti-God figure in this whole thing. There's a few Pharaohs in the story. Um, they're the ones who are going to go up against God, against Yahweh. Um, and so he wants to make their life worse because there's too many of them. He thinks if I can oppress them more, uh, they won't multiply so many to be so many people. So they made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. So there's a couple kinds of labor that they're in. One is making bricks. Not a fun job. Hot, you're working it with a kiln, with fire. Um, it's hot as it is, and it's very labor intensive. The other one is working in the fields. And so the strategy is, we'll work these people so hard that they don't have time, energy, or health to procreate. We'll work them that hard that they can't reproduce anymore. And so they're working hard. They're building, uh, not the pyramids, unfortunately. Uh, they're building storage cities, it says. They're building granaries, places to store all of this grain. And he works them hard, but it doesn't work. Plan A fails. And so they go to plan B. 
the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. So Pharaoh is afraid of soldiers, right? He treats these people horribly. He knows he does. And he's afraid that if an enemy comes along, they're all going to join and fight for the other team. So he wants to get rid of as many soldiers. So he says, we'll kill the boys. Because they have boys who will grow up to be soldiers. Now, he would be smarter to kill the girls because the girls are the ones who give birth to the boys eventually. Um, but Pharaoh doesn't have that kind of wisdom. So he says, we're going to kill, as, uh, kill these boys as they're being born. Um, one of the peculiar things about Exodus is we never know the names of the pharaoh. So if you ever studied Egypt history and stuff, there's all these different pharaohs. Um, the Bible never says which pharaoh. So the pharaoh never gets his name in the Bible. I don't know if you've ever had your name omitted from a list, like maybe the uh, college and career list going to the first hand and being thrown under the bus. Going to school, you've got some names omitted from that list. Dakota was one of those. Doesn't feel good to have your name left off the list, does it? Terrible. That's how Pharaoh felt. All this stuff that he did, he didn't even get his name in the Bible. You know who got their names in the Bible? Shifra and Pua. These two courageous women. We don't know if they're uh, Egyptian or if they're Hebrews, but their job was to be midwives, to help deliver babies. Um, and they're heroes. There's lots of Lots of female heroes at the beginning of, of the book of Exodus. And these two are, are two of them. Um, and they get their names in the Bible for all eternity because uh, they refuse to do what the king says. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. That's a bad job if you're a midwife and they say, if you see it's a boy, kill the baby. But that's a pretty brutal assignment. And Shifra and Pua say, we're not doing this. And they make up a lie, and they tell Pharaoh, "Ah, oh, we, you know, we tried to kill these babies, but uh, by the time we get there, they'd already given birth, so it was too late." They lie straight to Pharaoh's face, and God is pleased, and God blesses them, and they get their own families, and they get their names in the Bible. So that plan doesn't work either, because of Shifra and Pua. So plan A fail, work them hard. Plan B kill them when they're being born. He goes to plan C, which is just flat out. Genocide. Then Pharaoh gave this word to all his people. Everybody, I want you all to know about this. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl have it. So it's just flat out baby murdering. So later on, if you have a tendency to feel sorry for Pharaoh as you know, stuff happens, don't feel so sorry for Pharaoh. He begins as opposing God, saying, We're going to murder all the baby boys that we can find. And so that's kind of the low point. Exodus start, starts off just getting worse and worse and worse. Until you get to the end of chapter 2, and then the redemptive story just begins. So chapter 2 is a story of one family, and it's a great story. So great that you can make it into a Disney movie. So great that 24 years ago, a young man going on his first date with a young woman decided that they would go to this movie on their first date. And they're living happily ever after today. Yeah, thank you, thank you. And we went to Petland, where did we go? Petland, Olive Garden, the Prince of Egypt. Not a bad first date. We had a piranha in our dorm room and I needed to buy feeder fish. So, yeah, that man was good for that. <laughs> Anyways, how did we get off track? It's a good story. It's a Hollywood kind of story, and we're going to enter into this story. It's not a kid's story. Okay? It's in a cartoon, and kids love it, and I can, I'm not sure what the curriculum is for this year, but they're probably going to teach something about Moses in Sunday school. But just because we teach it to our kids doesn't mean it's a kid's story. This is an important story. If you were to ask Jesus, or any of his disciples, any of the Pharisees, ask them, what's the most important story in the Bible? They would all answer, the story of Moses. This is how God saved our people. They would all say, this is the most important story in all of Scripture. The same way that we would say the death and resurrection of Jesus 
is the most important story in our Bibles. So this story shapes all of Jewish history. It is, it is their salvation story. So here's the story. A bit of the news. A man of the tribe of Levi, Levi, married a Levite woman. So these parents don't get their names in the Bible, unfortunately, are they? They're just Moses' mom and dad. And she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. Another little place where our, our, our English doesn't show you everything that's going on. Because your Bible might say a fine child. Anything else that your Bible says there instead of fine? NLT is uh, special. Boo. King James? Goodly. A goodly child. At least that's the old King James. Which is not a great English word, goodly. But that's actually what the word is. In Hebrew, it's tov. And if you think, there's a, there's a callback to creation. God created the world, and when he created it, he said it was tov. It was good. And so this woman has birth, gives birth to this child, and she sees him, and she sees, ah, oh, this is goodness. This is part of God's good creation. I can't throw this away. Children, babies, are a part of God's good creation. They cannot be thrown in the grave. So there's a link back to the creation story that we missed, but I want to point out. Imagine the stress of a pregnancy in a time like this. You live in a world where if you have a baby boy, that boy can be thrown into the river, and you're pregnant, and you have no ultrasound, you don't know if it's going to be a boy or a girl, but you're praying that it's going to be a girl. And imagine the stress that enters into your household when that baby comes out and it's a boy. Now what do you do? Now you have to try to hide this child. Because people are looking, and they're taking babies away. Every once in a while in town, you will hear the wail of a woman whose baby has just been discovered and taken from her hands. And you know another baby's been taken. And here you are with your little baby boy, wondering, how long can I hide him? How long until somebody finds and so in her absolute desperation, she decides to abandon her, her baby in the hopes that maybe something will happen where God will look down on him and God will be with him. It says, when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him, coated it with tar and fish, and then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. So what was, where were this baby supposed to be thrown? Into the Nile. So she got asked, she could say, yep, I threw my baby in the Nile. So technically she did what she was supposed to do. But she provided for this baby. She built a basket. And she coated it with pitch. In Hebrew, basket is a tava. She built a tava and coated it with pitch so it would be waterproof. Somebody else in the Bible so far has built a tava. It's only happened once. His name was Noah, and he built a tavah and coated it with pitch. It's the exact same word. Noah's was a lot bigger. Moses' his mother's was a lot smaller. But we're supposed to see a connection to Noah and the flood. He built a tavah, covered it in pitch, it went through the water, and God saved everybody who was inside. Moses' his mother built a tavah covers it in pitch, it goes through the water, and spoiler alert, God's going to save everybody who's inside. There's all these little clues along the way that this is, God is in all of this. God is working. He's protecting. And his older sister, I don't know how old you picture her, I picture her kind of like seven or eight years old, uh, she stood at a distance to see what would happen to her. That's a bad spot for a big sister to be in. Little brother gets abandoned in a little papyrus basket floating in the bed. Will he starve to death? Will he die of thirst? Will he die of heat? The Nile River's full of crocodiles. Will a crocodile come and get him? What's going to happen to little brother? So he doesn't have a lot of time, right? This baby can survive on his own for a few hours, maybe a day at the very most. And then one of these great coincidences happens. Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe. 
and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. So there's all these coincidences that just happen when God is involved. Two weeks ago, we looked at the story of Ruth. And it's, you know, in, in Hebrew, it says, she happened to happen upon Boaz's field. Just a real coincidence, she ended up on the right field. Here's another one of these just great coincidences that she just happened to go bathe at the time when this baby was in the water. And so she finds this baby. She feels sorry for it. And I love this older sister. She's got some guts to talk to Pharaoh's daughter. The sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Great idea. I don't know if God gave up. God must have given her that idea, right? But she's, she's smart. She's on her feet. And before this woman can figure out what to do with this baby, she steps in and says, I got an idea. Should I do this? And Pharaoh's daughter, Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. So what's happening to the mother at this time? Mom's at home. She just put her baby in the Nile River, abandoned her baby. She is either on her bed, sobbing because of the loss of her son, or she's on her knees praying. I don't know. Those are both the only two options I can think of for what she's doing. And in one of those positions, down on the floor, her daughter comes running in, and says, Mom, they found the baby. What? Yeah, they found the baby, and they're looking for a Hebrew woman to nurse the baby. You gotta come. Can you imagine the mother? You just abandoned your baby. I'm sure she prayed. And here God answers her prayer within hours. And she goes out there trying to keep a straight face, straight face, you know, to see Pharaoh's daughter. And Pharaoh's daughter talks to her. She has, Pharaoh's daughter has no idea that this is her son. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I'll pay you. And Moses' mother is just like, Oh, okay, yeah, sure, that's good. I'll give you some costs. Yeah, I can do that. Uh, so the woman took the baby and nursed him. And when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She, that's Pharaoh's daughter, named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. So God's at work. God's involved in this whole thing. Not only does she get to keep her son, she gets paid to raise him. God did that. Sometimes God answers your prayer within minutes or hours. And sometimes he does not. This other situation that's going on is the hardship of the rest of the Israelites. Sometimes God works slowly. So now Moses goes to Pharaoh's court, and he's being raised there in Pharaoh's household. And he's being shaped by leaders to be a leader himself and all of that. And in those 20-some years, life for the Israelites was still awful. They were still being worked to death, maybe more baby boys still being killed. Um, life was awful. And they had no idea that in the palace that they could see, a young man was being raised who was going to save them someday. But they had no clue that God was doing any of these things. Year after year, life is hard. And they keep crying out to God. And apparently God is doing nothing. God was doing all kinds of things. They just couldn't see us. And I wonder if that's our experience sometimes today. And Lauren, you kind of mentioned this already. Where it seems like, God, are you not doing anything? And yet God is doing all kinds of things that we're just simply unaware of. So this goes on for a long time. And it says one day, after Moses had grown up, there's a story he goes out and he sees an Egyptian beating up one of his fellow Israelites. And he looks this way and that to see if anybody's watching, and no one seems to be watching, and he murders the Egyptian. This comes out of the blue, that all of a sudden Moses is a murderer. And he, he murders this guy and he buries him in the sand goes back to the palace. Next day he comes out, he sees another fight. He's a kind of a hero guy, he's like, he likes to break up fights. And so he steps into this next fight, and he's going to break it up, and the guy who's beaten the other guy says, are you going to kill me like you did the Egyptian? And all of a sudden Moses realizes somebody was watching. He thought nobody was looking, but somebody saw. And he's, he's been found out 
to be a murderer. Word reaches Pharaoh's household, and when Pharaoh hears of this, he tries to kill Moses. So his life has come undone in 24 hours. He killed the guy one day, the next day it gets discovered, and he's on the run. And he flees, he goes to Midian where he sits down by a river. Things have gone way off track for Moses. I don't know what plan A was. Maybe he was going to try to save his people from within the palace, try to reform the government and see how he could you know, lighten the load or something like that. That's all out the window. His plan is way off track. He's a murderer and he's running away from home. But here's the thing. God is really good at dealing with your life when it's off track. When your life gets off track, all God does is build a new track from where you are to Him. And say, okay, this is where you are. Let's work from this. And if you get off track again, He'll build you a new track and say, okay, this is where you are. Let's go here. So that's what God does for Moses. He's way off track. But God meets him where he is. And Moses runs into seven sisters. And these sisters are out there with their flocks and they're trying to get water, and there's some bad shepherds who are running them off the well. And Moses, he's this hero, right? He steps in and he saves the day for these ladies. And he waters all their flocks, and he falls in love with them, named Zipporah, marries her, has a son. So now he's settling down. He's got a new life. He's living in Midian. He's raising a family. He's become a shepherd. Lots of years are going by. We're going to get to the end of what we're going to look at for the story here right away. It says, During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. I just want you to notice that first four words. During that long period, it took a long time of life going very poorly. Long time doesn't mean God is absent. They are groaning in their slavery and they are crying out. And scripture tells us that their cries went up to God. Seemingly unanswered prayers does not mean they do not go up to God. Think of a little toddler who's hungry and they're crying because they want something to eat. And as a good parent, you go to the kitchen and it takes you five minutes to prepare them to eat your lunch. In those five minutes, that toddler is thinking, no one's understanding what I want. I'm not getting what I want. Meanwhile, what you're wanting is being prepared for you. You just don't understand. And so during that long time, the people of Israel had no clue that God was working, but he was. And I want to close on this. God heard their groaning. He remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. I want us to pay attention to the four words that God heard. God heard. They cried out, they groaned, and God was not inattentive. He was not floating on a cloud somewhere. God heard. The second thing God did is God remembered. It's not that God forgot, but he remembered his covenant. He had been in a covenant with these people. I will be your God, you'll be my people. People have a responsibility, God has a responsibility. And God remembers that. I remember my wife's birthday every year. It doesn't mean I have ever forgot it in order to remember it, but every year I call it to mind. This is what God is doing. He's calling to mind his covenant relationship. Third thing he did is he looked down. God actually saw what was going on, the hardships in their life, and he was moved by it. He was concerned. This did not sit well with God. And when God is concerned, God acts. We have to come back next week to find out what God does. But in the meantime, we're in a situation of groaning and crying out to God. And I just want to invite you this morning to think, what is it that you cry out to God for? What is it if you say, God, if there's one thing you could do this week? Is it to fix your marriage? To fix your finances? Is it to fix your health? What are the challenges in your life that you've been dealing with maybe for a long time that you cry out to God for? 
Name that thing in your, in your heart. And maybe you've got five things. That's fine. Name all five. What are the things that are on your heart? And maybe you look at yourself and say, I'm pretty blessed. I'm actually doing pretty well. But here's someone in my life who I love. I care deeply about this person. And they are going through What's the word? Hard times. And God, I care for that person. If you could do one miracle, I wish you would heal this person. I wish you would help them in their marriage. I wish you would help them in their relationships. What is it? Their health. Name those things in your heart this morning that you are crying out for. This story assures us that our prayers do not bounce off the ceiling. They are heard by a God who remembers, looks, and cares. And God always answers your cry. Sometimes with miraculous salvation, and sometimes He'll give you more of the Holy Spirit to endure what you have to do. It's never no. Sometimes we talk about how you know God is either yes, no, no, right? no, no, no. It's never no. God never says no. When you ask, God always provides. He will give you what you're asking for, or He will give you more of the Holy Spirit to endure what you have to face in that moment. But He will give you something. He always hears. He always responds. He always gives. He is always working, even when we don't see it. Just because you, you look at that situation that you named in your heart, and you might say, I cannot see God anywhere in this. That does not mean God is not in it. The Israelites had no clue about Moses for decades, and their life was horrible, and yet God was working. He heard their prayers, he remembered his covenant agreements to be there for them, he saw their suffering, he was concerned, and he was just about to do something about it. So when life is hard, hang on. Never stop praying or crying out to God. God hears and he cares and he may be just about to do something. Let's pray. So Father, in this room, um, we are facing all kinds of struggles. There are all kinds of things in our life that are hard, that we wish were different. And so we just name those things in our heart right now, and Lord, we know that you know them, but we name them before you. And we cry out to you, God, to act, to intervene, to do something about these situations. And we will trust, Lord, that you are at work, even though sometimes we cannot see it at all. I pray that you would give us strength for the road, faithfulness to carry on as we wait, and trust that you are there, that you are good, that you hear us, that you see us, and that you are able.